Listen, I'm so excited that I get to share with you this morning. Um, listen, over the last several weeks, we've started on a, uh, uh, a series called Summer Playlist. And basically what that means is that it's a series without a topic. It just means that uh, us different pastors are coming up and sharing with you whatever God has laid on our heart. And I have something that I want to share with you this morning. Now, before I share, I want to kind of set the tone for, for my sharing. And what I have for you today isn't some polished up sermon that, that like is intended at getting you to, to, to praise God or whatever, although you should praise God. I have just something that I want to share from the very private part of my life. Is that okay? And, and I hope that, that we can have a vibe of just being in my living room together and, and, and maybe we're having a good meal and, 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 and sharing some heart-to-heart -heart conversations. That's what I want to share with you today. I want to share with you essentially what God has been speaking to me over the last several months and, and this, the, just this ongoing challenge about what I, what I hear God calling me to. So it's, it's nice to be back in church together. How many of y'all are, are happy to be here? Come on, praise God, make some noise. Because you know you're getting sick of, 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 of just being in your house, right? Uh, you know, I got a joke for you. You got to thank God for, for spouses. You know why? Because if it wasn't for spouses, we'd have to fight with strangers. So... <laughs> So some of y'all been in the house cooped up, your kids have been cooped up, and thank God that we get to be free and we get to come out. But this last season of COVID-19 has been, had an impact on every single one of us, right? How many of you will be honest and say it's had an impact on me? One way or another, it's, it's changed our world. It's changed the way we see things. And I got to be real honest with you, when, the first, when it first... Um, Came about, I'm the type of guy that, like, like I read a ton of stuff uh, on Google and things like that. And Now, who, what I'm not is the guy who sees the meme that, that says, uh, this is the news, and then reposts it. Because most of the time, it's fake. All you got to do is do some diligence and dig through some sources, but you'll find truth, right? And, and early on, I realized that, that this thing was pretty serious. And, and, and it really brought me into this place of, of feeling a little overwhelmed with it. There came a day where I was like, man, I cannot read another article about COVID-19. I don't want to hear anything else. I don't want to see anything else. Anybody else been there? You're just done with it, right? Um, matter of fact, I, 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 I was just over it. But there came a point. There came a point where, where, where the enemy really started trying to attack me. And I remember laying on my couch, being filled with anxiety. And, and in my mind, it was like, like COVID-19 was in Denver for some reason. It was coming this way. I don't know which way it's really coming from. But in my mind, there was this big bad monster called COVID-19 running across the past. And he was coming after me. I was laying there and I was thinking, man, you're coming for me. You're coming for me. That's it. That's it. Baby, I love you. Uh, kids. Be good, you know, like saying my goodbyes to everybody. But I was stressed out by it. Anybody else been there at all or just me? You're all going to try to say it's just me. Liars. In church. In church. No, but I got overwhelmed, right? But, but it was in this moment of being overwhelmed that God began to speak to me. How many of y'all know that God allows us to get to these places where we are outside of our strength, where we are overwhelmed, where we feel helpless, and we feel out of control? How many of y'all know that God allows us to be in those places sometimes? And let me go a step further. I would say not only does God allow you to be in those places, God actually rejoices when we are in those places. You're saying, why? Why? Because if it wasn't for the realities of life around us, some of us would never turn to our Heavenly Father and acknowledge Him for who He is and acknowledge our own weakness and reach out to Him. Some of the most holy places you can be on earth is not necessarily in church, but it's in the middle of a turmoil. It's in the middle of a challenge. It's in the middle of a test. It's in the middle of everything being broken all around you. Those places are so holy because that's the moment when our ears are turned towards heaven, when our faith is, is heightened, and we're saying, God, I've looked to the left, I've looked to the right, I've looked all over, God, and there is nothing around me that can give me peace. 
I don't find it when I look at my bank account. I don't find it when I go to the store. I don't find it when somebody's nice to me. God, I need you right now. And as I began to think about the reality of COVID-19, it brought me to another thought. And this is a thought that the wise must focus on. Matter of fact, it says in the Bible that wisdom is found in the house of those who mourn. In other words, wisdom is only gained by making mistakes. How many of y'all made mistakes in here? Anybody? And when we make those mistakes and we realize the reality of life and that we need Jesus, then we can start to, to be built up and we can start to have a different perspective. And the one thing that I was thinking as big bad COVID was running over the mountain just for Micah. I began to realize the truth that we all must live in every day. And that is that this life is short. So listen, I know we can be on a mountaintop with tons of money, great health, and everything going good around us. But don't get too comfortable because even on that mountaintop, tomorrow is not promised to you. Next week is not promised to you. And in the same way, you could be in a valley overwhelmed with all of the difficulties of life. I also want to encourage you that this life is not all there is. That there's going to come a day when we will close our eyes in this life and we will wake up to the glorious inheritance that God has for us. And he will say one thing. Well, I'm, I'm wanting him to say one thing on that day. And it's not, Micah, you're so awesome. You, you're so good. I want him to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's it. Because nothing matters. I realized like when, when all this stress is going around, I looked up and I had three healthy kids. I have an incredibly beautiful wife that still loves me and sticks by me. And I realized, man, like what else do I need in this moment? But God allowed me to look at the brevity of life, the shortness of life, and, and in that thought, we, we, we inevitably got to start thinking, well, what is life all about? Is it just to, to, you know, go around the sun a couple times and have a couple birthdays? Is it, is it just to eat good food and, and, and have good company and have a little bit of savings? Is that really what life is all about? Such simple things. But, I really, but, but what I want to tell you today is that life is about so much more. That God created each and every one of us with a purpose, with a plan, with, with, with the owner's manual. And he's got a great plan for us to live out. But it's stressful. Life is stressful. And I want to start in Ecclesiastes 3 right now. Right before this verse, it talks about there's a time for everything under, the, under heaven. Time to be born, a time to die, a time to, time to, to fight, a time to, to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build up. It's all of these things. And then he gives us this, this very wise perspective right here. And he said, uh, the writer says, I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. So first thing I want you to know is that in this life, we carry a burden with us all the time. And you should carry that. And you should be aware of it. Because that burden is reality. What is it? He said, he has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. What is the burden? The burden is this human experience. A lot of scientists, when they try to define life, how they define life is consciousness. That we are conscious of the past. How many of y'all remember yesterday? We are conscious of where we are right now, right? How many of y'all know where you're at? Just want to make sure. Who does not know where you're at? Ushers, will you please help me real quick? Help this Raiders fan in the back. <laughs> we, we all remember yesterday. We're all conscious of where we are right now. But it's also connected to another th uh, uh, thought in consciousness. We all know what our vision for the rest of the day is. How many of y'all got plans for the rest of the day? How many got plans for this week? Go ahead and come up here, buddy. How many of y'all got plans for the rest of the week, right? And, and that's what, what scientists will talk about life as, that it's this consciousness of yesterday, right now, and the future all at once. And they'll argue, uh, are plants conscious of yesterday? I don't know, my poor grass, man, he must have PTSD because every week I come with a big old helicopter and cut it down, you know? Uh, do, do animals have that consciousness? We don't know, but humans have this. Humans have this. I've seen the burden that God has laid on the human race. What is it? 
He made everything beautiful in its time. In other words, you only have a limited amount of time to do what you got to do. You only have today to work because nighttime's coming when no man can work tomorrow, right? When no man can work, you only have a limited amount of time. And guess what? If you don't accomplish what you, you, you set out to accomplish, you're going to go into eternity. See, that verse is all about consciousness of past, present, and future. That's what he's talking about right now. And he's saying it is a burden. It is a burden to know that we have a limited amount of time. Now, as I lay there and I was, I was dealing with this reality of how short life was, I began to have another thought. And that thought was that if, if life is much more than the things I mentioned, you know, going to work, eating food, having fun, but is, is that really all there is to life? I'm here today to tell you that God has designed you for so much more. He's designed you to impact people's lives in eternity. He's designed you to love your children, not for the sake of just saying, my dad loves me, but so that you can discipline them and grow them up into men and women that would accomplish their great purpose and calling. This is what life is about. And matter of fact, as you read uh, Matthew 24 and 25, which we're going to get to in a minute, it's all about the second coming. It's a, a series of parables. If you have a red letter Bible, it's 24 and 25. It's all red letters. And he's talking about what this life is. And he's contrasting it against heaven and against eternity. He's saying that you will be ready for eternity when you get these lessons. So this life is to prepare you for the life to come. That's part of what this life is all about. How many of y'all have ever had a dream? See, I remember, I remember, uh, how many of y'all remember calling cards? Anybody remember calling cards? You'd have to dial the 800 number, then you'd have to put in your PIN number, then you'd have to put in the number of whoever you're calling. Anybody remember that? This is before cell phones. <laughs> or maybe you're really poor, I don't know. It's what, you know. But I had this dream. And the dream was pretty, pretty similar. It was, it was the dream where my fingers were too fat. You ever had that one? You know, and I'm trying to call my mom or somebody, and it's important. I've got to talk to her right now. But inevitably, I put in the number, and it's like, dee, 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 right, wrong number. And then for whatever reason, I couldn't get the number through. And I, how about this one, where you're running. You're running from somebody. You're running from COVID-19, right? But you're like in water. You're just like, Anybody remember that dream? Anybody had these dreams? Come on, be honest. We've all had this dream to one degree or another. I was telling Pastor Josh, I said, I have this other one that when I would go preach, or I used to travel around the country and preach and speak, and, and every, every night, it was like I would be restless all night, and it was always the same dream. I, I was in the hotel trying to print out my notes, and it wouldn't work. So I ran to Kinko's. Remember Kinko's? I ran to Kinko's and tried to, but I couldn't find it, right? Or, or they were closed, and it was like I wasn't, I was out of control, and I was unprepared. Why do we have these dreams? Because we are conscious that there is this great purpose that God has for us, but we're also conscious of knowing that there are things that would try to slow us down and hinder us in this moment, and we have this anxiety of not being able to do what we're supposed to do. Anybody, anybody with me right now? Not being able to accomplish what we're supposed to accomplish. I want to tell you something. That you are made for so much. What would happen if we never accomplished our God-given purpose on earth? Who would be affected by that? If I never did what I was supposed to do, would it affect somebody? You may not realize this, but it would. If you every day didn't do what you were supposed to do, it wouldn't just affect you, but it would affect others. And then it would affect me. And then it would affect us. And then it would affect the country. And then it would affect all this other stuff. You know, I'm sympathetic to what's going on right now in our country with racism and this kind of stuff. But listen, uh, B Bureau of Land Management, I mean, Black Lives Matter. Every time I see BLM, that's what I think. Bureau of Land Management? I got to tell you, man. Every life matters. And to say that one, per one person's life matters above others is not the right approach. And matter of fact, I'm going to go out on a limb right now, and I'm going to say, you guys can throw rocks at me, but, you know, um, do it after service when I'm in my truck and I can drive away real fast. Or I'll just spite you. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Uh, <laughs> 
But the answer is not to go riot in the streets and tear down our buildings and businesses and that sort of thing. People who do that are not protesting, but they are thugs. Okay? It's true. If, 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 if there's inequities in our culture, you know what the solution is? It isn't to protest. Protesting is good. But it isn't to protest. It isn't to, to, to pick sides and fight with each other. You know what the solution to what's going on in our country is? It's simple. Obviously, it's Jesus, right? Love God. But you know what else it is? If you really want to protest, let me give you the best way to protest, young people. Two words. Be better. Be better. Period. If you don't like the, the injustices and how some people are, 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 are abusing laws, be better. Go write the laws. Change the situation. If you don't like how people are homeless, then own a business and create homes and be generous. If you don't like what's going on, take all of that energy and quit focusing it all around you and focus it on yourself. Be better. Then connect with other people that are strong and that are being together and being better. And guess what will happen? Over time, we'll have a movement of people that are all that God called them to be, doing what only, only God could do in our country. Be better. Be better. And you have a limited amount of time to do that. And Jesus understood this. And he spoke to this principle that I want to talk to you about. It's a principle of stewardship. And here's what the definition of biblical stewardship is. This is what we're talking about. Utilizing and managing all resources God provides for the glory of God and the betterment of his creation. Now, let me tell you something. That money you think you have, that health you think you have, that job you think you have, those shoes you think you have, those pants you think you have, that bed you sleep in, that, that the road you drive in, everything, none of it belongs to you. And it doesn't belong to the government. But it all belongs to God. He owns everything. And he wants to make you better at managing what you have. Listen, we all know people, and we might be in need of miracles. And sometimes we're in very real need of miracles. But sometimes a miracle is a shortcut answer trying to catch us up to where the blessing of stewardship should already have you. I mean, y'all heard what I said. Sometimes we're looking for a financial miracle. God, uh, uh, get me out of this mess. Help me to pay my mortgage. When God is saying, look, day after day after day, you wasted money on fast food, you blew your money, you didn't handle what I gave you, and now you want me to give you, now you want to win the lottery. Be better. Manage what you have to manage. Because there's some very real principles here. And what we're going to start in Matthew 25 and verse 14, and this is how it starts. So I want you to think about this idea of stewardship, this idea of being better, this idea of, cre of accomplishing our purpose. It doesn't happen accidentally. There's a very clear path to how success happens in life. And none of it's flashy. And we're going to talk about some of these things. Uh, it starts here, it says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and what? entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to what? His ability. Then he went on his journey. Here's what I want you to know. That God entrusted, he owns everything, and everything you have has been entrusted to you by him. Your body has been entrusted to you by God. What you do, the little things that you do matter. When you're born, you look like your parents. When you die, you look like your decisions. I want you to think about that. I've, I've had the, in, in almost 20 years of pastoring, I've buried, I buried caskets that were, I buried people that were old. And the one thing that I realized is when they were little, they were cute. When they were old, they looked like cirrhosis. When they were little, they looked like their mom and dad. When they were old, they were beat up. Why? Because of the decisions they made. So my question is, what decisions are you making every single day? What are you doing with your time? A lot of people say, I want more. I want more money. 
well, how can you ask God for more money when you don't take care of the $5 you do have? There's a principle here. Say, God, I want my body to be healthy, and I want to I, I be the best that I can be. Then you got to stop eating tacos and tamales and burritos at midnight. And you've got to exercise some discipline and get to sleep on time and get up early. And, 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 when, and, and when, when, when there's projects or chores that need to be done, go do them. Why? My son tells me, uh, I'll tell him, hey, pull the weeds. And, and you know how you're going to know when the weeds are done being pulled? Because your eyes will tell you. You'll look at all those rocks and guess what you'll see? Rocks. No weeds. But inevitably, I go out there, and, 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 and then I see a weed here and here and here. I'm like, come on, guys. Well, it's not that big a deal. It's just a little weed. It is a big deal. If you can't learn to take care of the little manageable things in your life, the little weeds, you're never going to be able to cut out the big root that's growing and trying to destroy you. If you can't take care of the $5 you have, how are you going to take care of the $5 million that God wants to give you? Everybody says, I'll give when I win the lottery. No, you won't. Money is, 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 is like a magnifying glass. You only become more of what you were or less of what you were when you have it. If I was stingy with $5, I ain't giving you a dime when I got $5 million. But the other side of that coin is God might not allow me to get the $5 million because he knew I couldn't handle the $5. So I think this is, this is very important, that we realize that God entrusted everything to us. And it says that to the one he gave five, to one two, and to one one. Now, really, in the Bible right here, he's not talking about your abilities or your talent to sing or this kind of stuff. It can be applied, but he's talking about money right here. So let's start from that vantage point, and then we'll work towards these other assertions of what this uh, verse can mean. Now... When he says he gave him a talent, it was really a, 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 a denarii, which really is equal to about a year's worth of wages for a, a laborer. So when he gave the guy one talent, he didn't just give him nothing. He gave him in today's standard about $25,000. So the one that he gave five to, he gave about $250,000. So he wasn't giving nothing. He gave something of great value. And listen, and then he went away. And, and this was a common practice back then because there was no cell phones or emails or anything like this. So if I was going to go away on a long trip, I couldn't manage my affairs from a far away, right? There was no ability to do that. So what, what people would do, well, uh, they would say, hey, I'm giving this much to Rob, right? I'm giving this much to so-and-so, and I'm giving this much to this guy. And then he said, now you guys got to manage it for me, and I'm coming back. That's literally what was a common practice, and that's also what's happened with us. We have a father who's given us all of these great talents, money. But he, yes, he has given us gifts and abilities and spiritual gifts and all these other things he's given to us. But what he's saying is, I'm going to come back, and you're going to give an account for what you did with what I gave you. I don't know about you, but that should make you, that makes me think really seriously. God, you mean at one point, I'm not gonna just answer for the words I said, but I'm gonna answer for how I laid on the couch? Come here, with me. I'm gonna answer for the condition I kept my car in? And, 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 and you're saying, some of you are saying, no, you're not gonna answer. There's no such thing as a small thing. Anything you do, the Bible says, whatever you do, do it with half your heart. Right? Is that what it says? Come on, somebody correct me. Whatever you do, do it with all your heart as unto the Lord. For it is God who repays you and not men. And I want to tell you something. That somebody is always watching. And that somebody is Jesus Christ himself. And he's not saying, hey, if you get this wrong, you're going to hell. No, he's already made heaven a reality for us because of the cross and, and grace alone, period. What he is saying is, are you going to waste what I gave you or are you going to add to what I gave you? Because I have given you something and it is significant. It is a significant amount. So what is he talking about? He's talking about the life resources such as time, money, abilities, and authority. 
what are you doing with what you have today? That's a sobering question that I think we should all ask. What am I doing with what I have today? Like, I, I, I'm down right now about 35 pounds. And you know why? And I'm not where I want to be because I realized one thing. Okay, if COVID's coming for me and I'm going to fight COVID, well, I ain't going to fight him as a sloppy old fat man. I'm going to fight him on my terms. How do you understand what I'm saying? I couldn't control the anxiety of the situation. As a matter of fact, when I focused on what I couldn't control, I became over overwhelmed. But when I took my focus and I put it on what I could control, I'm going to tell you, I begin to have peace. Now I feel like I'm like getting ready for a fight. And who knows? I might lose that fight, but I'm going to heaven. When you focus on what you can do, God takes care of what you cannot do. He gave according to each of his own, to his own ability. God has entrusted his very best to you. And again, what are you doing with it? Verse 16, it goes on. And he says, the man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. So I wanted you to focus on right here. What did this guy do when he got the five bags? He didn't wait. He didn't procrastinate. He didn't sit around and dream. He didn't keep looking at his bank account over and over again. Oh, I had no money. Now I've got 250 grand. No, what did he do? He took the perspective that this is loaned to me to manage by my master. He's going to come back one day and immediately went at once and put his money to work. He didn't wait. He didn't procrastinate. These two guys, they did their work promptly. Promptly. Many of us, we sit around and we say, you know what? Um, I'll deal with this tomorrow. We procrastinate. And I want you to know that one of the things that is going to rob you from God's purpose in your life is this insidious little disease called procrastination. It's insidious because it seems like it's not that big a deal. I'm tired. Well, boo-hoo, cry me a river. I'm tired too. Right? Come on, old folks, somebody help me. You know, my, my, my dad, I'm, I, I'm tired. Bro, you're 15. Get up. Get to work, dude. I'm 27, and I'm tireder than you. No, just joking. I'm more tired than you. I'm not 27. I'm 29. So, anyway, they did their work promptly. The, the next thing they did is they did their work with perseverance. I want to give you a secret to success. You guys ready for it? This is going to change your life. How many of y'all like revelations from God? Raise up your hand. A word from the Lord. You guys ready for the, the, the hair on the back of your neck to stand up and get goosebumps all over and you can shake if you want? You know what a secret to success is? Two words. Hard work. Hard work. Hard work. I've had people that work for me that had PhDs. I dropped out of high school. And the truth is, I saw them struggle and never get to where God had for them to be. Why? Because they didn't learn the simple lesson of hard work. When the sun is beating down on you, and when nothing seems to be working right, and you know the job that is in front of you, and you're pulling weeds, but more seem to be growing, guess what you got to do in that moment? Put your head to the task and keep pulling weeds. Don't get all in your feelings. Don't get all mixed up, but work hard. When you feel like going to bed and you look at, you look at your garage and it's in a mess or your yard or something like that, listen, go handle it. Why? It doesn't matter. God don't care about the way I handle my house. Yeah, he does. Because if you can't handle the little things that he's given you, how are you going to handle the great things that you haven't even seen yet? You're proving yourself to God every day with how you handle your vessel. How you handle your mind, how you handle your possessions, how you handle your money. Because if you don't control your money, your money will control you. If you don't control your body, your body will eventually control you. If you don't control your thoughts, your thoughts will eventually control you. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? And it ain't no fun to be controlled by all of these other things when God has made you the head and not the tail. He's made you to have dominion. Work hard. So they were prompt. They persevered. 
They did their work with success. God is with you when you give your best. Give all that you have. And watch how God doesn't bless you. And the last thing that they had in common is that they all kept in in mind this perspective. I've seen the burden that God has put on men. He's made everything beautiful in this season. And yet he has put eternity within the hearts of men. And man cannot fathom what he has done from beginning to end. What does that mean? They never lost sight of the fact that they were going to give an account. Just like them, one day you and I will stand before an almighty God, an all-loving and an all-gracious God, and we will give an account for every idle word. Lord, have mercy. We will give an account for what we did with relationships. Oh, yes, and you will give an account for what you did with your bank account. You will give an account for what we do with what belongs to God. God has entrusted you with his very best. And we see that that these servants gave their best. In verse 19, let's read on. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. To the man who had received five bags of gold, brought, uh, he brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me. You found me worthy of trust with five talents of gold. See, I have given, I've, I've gained five more. Now I have ten. His master replied something simple. Well done. Good. Somebody say good. And faithful. What does God require of you? To be good and to be faithful. He didn't say, well done, smart and handsome. Well done, educated and, 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 and savvy. He didn't say, well done, healthy and, 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 and a great speaker. He said, good and faithful. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. God has great things for you and I. But we will never grab them if we don't learn how to do the little things today. And I know this doesn't sound super spiritual, but I'm telling you, this is probably one of the most spiritual things you could set your mind to. Be faithful with what he's given you. Fathers, mothers, be faithful with the limited amount of time you have with those little kids. Because one day they will not be your children. One day they will be men and women that don't look up to you, but they look you eyeball to eye. And then they go do what they want. I told my kids, we went camping a couple weeks ago, and I sat them around the fire, and I pulled out my machete. (laughs) And I began to preach to them with my machete. (laughs) And I said, you think I'm hard on you right now, but one day you're going to be grateful. You think that when you say cleaning this dish is nothing, it's a big deal. And I told them, one day you're going to put, my youngest son started crying when I said this. I said, one day, you boys are going to put me and your mom on a box, and you're going to carry us to a hole, and you're going to put dirt on us. And my youngest son is crying. I said, quit crying, chump. (laughs) Just joking. And I said, and on that day, on that day, you will have everything you need to be a man, and you will be grateful that you learn how to do the little things. Let me finish this up. Uh, in verse 24, and now I'm about to finish. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came, Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. Too many of us live afraid. What was he afraid of? He had the wrong perspective. He had the wrong, he's the only one of the servants that said, you are a hard man. You reap where you have not sown. We all live life with glasses on. And those glasses are tainted by our own shame. And sometimes we don't see God as he truly is. 
And not only do we not see God as he truly is, we don't even see ourselves as we truly are. It's mired. It's an illusion. It's a deception. It's a lie. And if you don't see God as who, who he truly is, and you don't see yourself as you, as you truly are, you'll never be able to accomplish what God has for you. His problem was he had the wrong perspective. To his credit, he knew that it belonged to God, so he didn't just go out and blow it. He buried it, but he had the wrong perspective. I want you to know something, that God wants to heal you today. He wants to heal you of everything that you see. He wants to heal you of all of the wounds that you think God is and he's not. And he wants you to begin to see God as an incredibly loving and gracious God who's given you everything that you need. And he's not withholding anything from you for your success. And let's finish that last verse. He took away my screen. That's okay. His master replied, go choke him for me. His master replied. You see like the bar thing, he'll stick his head out and be like, pull him back in. His master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. Notice he contrasted something. You good and faithful against wicked and lazy. You have a choice. You can be good and faithful or you can be wicked and lazy. It's not enough just to come to church and profess things with our mouths. We've got to go and live what we confess by being good and faithful. And then he says this. You know, I harvested where I had not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit in the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back plus interest. Let's go to the finish this, this finishing verse. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. If you don't take advantage of what God gave you, somebody else will become a steward of it. If you can't manage yourself, somebody else will manage you. If you can't manage your freedom, the law will manage your freedom for you. If you can't manage your blessings, then somebody else will manage them. And he says this, for whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What I'm saying to you today is I'm not trying to end on a negative note. I'm trying to challenge you. The little things in your life, the relationship, kids, your room, adults, your yard, your car, whatever it is, take care of it. Take care of it. Not because you're trying to be prideful, but because you're trying to discipline yourself into being the person that God has for you so that you can have all that he has. Imagine if we were all good stewards of what we had and then we locked arms together. There would not be an unemployed person in our congregation. There would not be a homeless person in our congregation. There would not be a, a hungry person in our congregation. Why? Because we were made to be good stewards of God's blessings so that we could be a blessing to many.